Mm-hmm. Back to the, the first of the, the reading where you broke off, I have a puzzlement around the use of the word mind what the, in this context. It's uh, Scott's translation of this word noose. Uh, it simply means this universal permeating intelligence. And the statement there is that it is only available to an elite through... Uh, through... Um, asceticism and desire intent uh, and then there are prescriptions we haven't gotten into this but you know they lived a life of uh, purity although their definitions of purity varied that widely part of the, of the flip flop that uh, uh, man is brother of God and still we have to earn it to, it makes it not uh, that's right kind of a denial of that that's right. No, this persists right up until, well, to this moment. But, for instance, the quote I always love is from Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. Thomas Hobbes, you know, was the great theoretician of uh, modern government and social organization. And he was basically a paranoid SOB. And he says... Uh, in the Leviathan, he says, man to man is like unto an errant beast, and man to man is like unto a god. And it's absolutely true, you know. Our noblest aspirations and our most hideously dehumanizing activities take place in the context of our relationship to other people. This is... Uh, this is what the alchemists were trying to do, you see. They were trying to separate the gold from the dross. They were trying to take the errant beast, and when we look at alchemical art, we will see dragons, dogs, pigs. We will see the errant beasts, and we will see the angelic beings that are trying to be separated out of our nature. This is within each and every one of us. Man to man is like unto a god, and man to man is like unto an errant beast. This question having to do with the mind, mm-hmm. uh, according to my understanding of um, some of the Platonic tradition, Neoplatonic thought, this has to do with the divided mind in Plato. Uh huh. Well, you raise an important point. It further complicates the picture, but it ha- it's how it was, folks. And that is uh, the reference here is to Neoplatonism which is a kind of parallel tradition to what we're talking about Uh, Plato had at least a couple of phases in the evolution of his thinking the young Plato is a, a rational thinker but the later Plato apparently after he fell under the influence of Pythagorean schools it becomes a full-blown mystic. And then in the late Roman Empire, uh, now this is almost a thousand years after Plato. We have to remember, in our minds, all these people get squeezed together like they could all have dinner together. (laughs) But, you know, Plotinus is as far from Plato as we are from King Canute. So uh, you have to bear in mind the scale of history. But so 900 to 1,000 years after Plato, a Byzantine school of philosophy arose around Porphyry, uh, Plotinus, and Proclus as the major exponents. And they worked with the late Plato and elaborated a beautiful mystical cosmology. This is what I did a workshop here on a year ago. And many of those ideas and terms parallel conceptually the stuff in the Corpus Hermeticum. And if you're of a certain intellectual bent, you may find yourself more comfortable with the Neoplatonists than with this. This material tends to be emotional, uh, evocative, poetic and while there's great poetry in Plotinus there's also very tight thinking that goes along with it and there are other traditions I mean I'm making it simple for you there was a whole tradition of what was called the Chaldean oracles uh, and this was a a collection of a hundred or more fragments 
all of which have uh, were the great commentary of Eusebius in 30 volumes, Iamblichus, one of them. Uh, that's all lost. Uh, we don't have that material. And it is, in a way, the most mysterious of these traditions because it just didn't survive. And it may be that that, the Chaldean oracles, is the missing link to push this stuff back several centuries deeper into time because the Chaldean oracles may actually be pre-Platonic. There's considerable evidence of that. But these are very arcane matters. I mean, you have to give yourself over to a lifetime of learning these languages and the philology of these languages to penetrate this stuff. Uh, the Hermetic Corpus was largely Alexandrine, and there were also Christian Platonists in Alexandria. There were certain centers, Rome, Byzantium, Alexandria, uh, uh, Heliopolis in Egypt was a cult site that was maintained for a very long time. If you're interested in this stuff but you don't like to absorb it this way, uh, Flaubert, of all people, the Flaubert of Ma Madame Bovary, wrote an incredible novel called The Temptation of Saint Anthony, and uh, in which he describes a second century Alexandria in a fictionalized form and gives you a real flavor for the intellectual complexity of the Alexandrine world. You see, Christianity had not yet gelled. It was many things. So you not only have Gnostics of five or six schools, Simonists, Valentinians, uh, Basilidians, and so forth, but you also have Christians, a number of cults calling themselves Christians, that were also in furious competition Docetists, Montanists, and later Nestorians. Uh, there were gymnosophists from India, people who were actually carrying yogic doctrines into the Mediterranean world. Plus, you then have all the uh, surviving cults of the older Egyptian strata, the cults of Isis and Seville and Adonis, and Dionysius, and it just goes on and on. I mean, uh, the richness of this intellectual world uh, is very... There's nothing comparable in our experience. And uh, it shows uh, the passion with which people were trying to understand the dilemma of a dying world, because this is what they were confronted with. The intellectuals of the empire could feel it all slipping through their hands. And Flaubert gives a wonderful picture of this. I mean, Flaubert has a very romantic streak, and he it's like smoking hashish to read this book. I mean, the attention to fabric and architecture and uh, food and odor. And, and then because the subject matter is the temptation of St. Anthony, it's an excuse to describe these temptations in all their sensual richness and erotic kinkiness. And it, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to absorb uh, this material. But, you know, <clears throat> yeah. the, the, somebody else raised the point about the elitism or an elite group of people. And if one considers uh, society as you had in Alexandria or some of the large centers, well, the only people who really had access to this were people who, first of all, had money. And, Correct. And who were well educated. Could read. And could, yeah. Yes, you had to so be able to I mean, read. There already you have an elite group. That's right. That's right. No, it, very definitely. What survives from a civilization is its literatures. And these literatures are usually the production of uh, an elite. And we have to remember, you know, don't have any illusions about the Roman Empire. I mean, I always think of the wonderful description, I don't even know why it's there, but uh, Boris Pasternak in Dr. Zhivago 
uh, goes off on a rip about ancient Rome and he describes it as a bargain basement on three floors. I mean, this was an empire that lived by human cruelty. It was on the backs of slaves that this uh, airy intellectual speculation was based. I mean, it was uh, uh, a tremendously pluralistic society, but that pluralism was maintained by standing armies of enormous size and uh, policies of occupation of enormous cruelty. I mean, because of our relationship to the Christian tradition, we're aware of such things as the zealot revolt of 69 and the reign of Herod Antiochus in Jerusalem and so forth and so on. But that was just one little corner of the empire. And in Armenia, in Gaul, in Spain, in North Africa, military governors were carrying out uh, outrageous suppressions of native populations. I mean, it was not a pretty time to be alive and uh, and what comes down to us then is the yearning to escape from that no wonder these people saw the earth as a cesspool and a trap because that's what it was for them without doubt and our own age is very similar i mean we do not have slavery but we suffer under uh, propaganda mass manipulation of ideas and uh, you know uh, the degradation and exploitation of the third world on a scale the Roman Empire couldn't even dream of so there is a great affinity if any of you are interested in this kind of thing I highly recommend a book by Hans Jonas called uh, The Phenomenon of Life it's a book of philosophical essays but there's one essay in there called Gnosticism and the Modern Temper in which he shows that once you take Gnosticism and dump the angels and the star demons and all the colorful bric-a-brac of late Roman thinking, what you have is a thoroughgoing existentialism, completely compatible with uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean Genet, and the kind of intellectual despair that characterized the post-World War II generation in Europe. Heidegger. Heidegger is thoroughgoingly Gnostic in his uh, intentionality. It's just that the, the language is modern and, and stripped of this magical thinking. And by being stripped of magical thinking, in a way, modern uh, the modern recension of that uh, uh, state of mind is even more hopeless and disempowering. Fortunately, uh, I think we're moving out of the shadow of that. But you know, I'm 44 years old. I grew up reading those people, and it made my adolescence much harder than it needed to be. I mean, my God, there wasn't an iota of hope anywhere to be found, you know. And that's why, for me, psychedelics broke over that intellectual world like a tidal wave of revelation. I mean, I just... I quoted to you last night Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, statement that nature is mute. I mean, this is uh, now I see this as an obscenity, almost an intellectual crime against reason and intuition. It's the, of the, logos. It's the absolute antithesis of uh, of the logos, and much of our world is ruled by men older than I am who are fully connected into that without any question mm -hmm. and they just think all the rest of this is namby-pamby ecological soft-heartedness or some sort there is no openness to the power of bios to the fact of a living cosmos this is what rupert sheldrake is always trying to say mm -hmm. the reinvestiture of spirit into matter the rebirth of the world soul uh, is uh, a necessary concomitant to what we now understand uh, about the real nature of the world. In a way, the theory of evolution, it, which is, was born in the 1850s, is the beginning of the turning of the tide. Because even though the first hundred years of evolutionary theory was fantastically concerned to uh, eliminate teleology, eliminate purpose 
Nevertheless, nobody ever understood that except the hardcore evolutionists. To everybody else, evolution meant ascent to higher form. And once, you know, I once heard someone say, if it doesn't have to do with genes, it ain't evolution. Well, that's a, a tremendously limited view of what evolution is. I mean, the or inorganic world is evolving. The organic world is evolving, and there the currency is genes. But also the social and intellectual world of human beings is evolving, and there the currency is not genes but memes. So that idea it carries with it the implication of ascent to higher form, and correctly broadened and understood becomes permission for a return to optimism and to the kind of hope that these folks were, were trying to uh, articulate. Uh, it seems to me that mind is, if it is available to trial, then we're back in a separation. I got it, you don't, or sometimes I do it. So, and this is, uh, uh, this is, to me, a false separation. Yes, you're right, uh, but it's a separation necessary for philosophical discourse. That's why philosophical discourse is not the top of the mountain. Uh, language itself is the process of making distinctions that are false. This is why all language is a lie. This is why the ultimate truth lies in something unspeakable. But the ascent to the unspeakable is, is through this kind of philosophical analysis. Um, let me see, that reminds me of something, but does somebody else have something they want to... Language is only the vehicle. Well, it's the vehicle, but eventually there's no road, and you have to park the vehicle and, and get out and walk, I think. And that's the journey. Plotinus, the great Neoplatonist, has this wonderful phrase. He calls the mystical experience the flight of the alone to the alone. And I love this image. It's so uncompromising, and it's so... It's about as true as something can be and still move in the realm of language because it's saying, you know, finally words fall away and finally there is only that which cannot be said. Many of you who've stuck with me know that I love to quote this poem by this obscure poet who died in the trenches of France in the First World War, Trumbull Stickney. And he wrote a poem called Meaning's Edge. And the punchline goes like this. Um, Meaning's Edge. I look over Meaning's Edge and feel the dizziness of the things you have not said. And I think that every one of these weekends, this is the effort to carry you to the edge of an abyss and then push you over into the dizziness of the things unsaid. And they'll always be unsaid. I mean, they are... Wittgenstein, God bless him, had the concept of what he called the unspeakable. He said philosophy operates in the realm of the speakable, but eventually we must confront that which cannot be said, the dizziness of things unsaid. And that's where real authenticity then flows back into the world of community and speech, but it comes from a place of utter silence and unsayability. How could it be otherwise? I mean, what hubris it would be to expect that the small mouth noises of English could encompass being. I mean, that, that's a primary error that all philosophy chooses to make at the beginning of its enterprise in order to do this set-up shop at all. Uh, no, these are lower-dimensional slices of, re of a reality that is ultimately unitary, ineffable, unspeakable, and dazzling. Anybody else? No? Shall we do more? Yeah, please. Philosophical discourse is verbal and mental masturbation. Absolutely. And masturbation, you see, because it is um, 
I, there's a pun here, but it's autopoetic. It is completely out of yourself. There is no uh, union with the other. And the other is what you're always trying to get to. The other is a common term in these literatures. Uh, the other uh, is that which cannot be fully known. You know, uh, I always like to quote the British enzymologist J.B.S. Haldane, who made a wonderful statement. He said, uh, the universe is not only stranger than we suppose, it is stranger than we can suppose. And that's a dizzying perception. It's one thing to think it's very strange. It's quite another thing to realize that it is stranger than you can suppose. You may suppose and suppose and suppose, and you will fall so far short of the mark that it's absurd. That's what it means to be in the presence of a mystery, you see. The modern word mystery translates out to unsolved problem. That's not what a mystery is. A mystery is not an unsolved problem. A mystery is a mystery. And ratiocination can exhaust itself and make no progress with it. And that's what's at the core of our being. And that was what was at the core of this ancient perception. I mean, these were thoroughly modern people. They were shoved up against the same things that tug at our hearts and our minds and our souls. And uh, beyond that, there's not a whole hell of a lot that you can say about it. This is an idea that will not die, but its practitioners, as you say, they end up in footnotes. They do not have a happy faith. Certainly Henri Bergson, with his idea of the elan vital, this is a, an effort to preserve this idea of the world soul and yet, you know, the fate of Bergson, his influence on modern society, on modern philosophy is certainly minimal. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead is my great favorite. I mean, I think Whitehead is just, uh, uh, you know, the cat's pajamas. And he has this idea of a living cosmos, he, that life and vitality extend right down into the electron. And yet... Um, in spite of his mathematical contributions, the fact that he wrote Principia Mathematica with Bertrand Russell, uh, Whitehead is not taught. I mean, there's some, I guess, one university in this country where they take him seriously. Uh, the modern philosophy is a desert for my money. And who cares about it? Nobody cares about it. Who's living their life according to uh, the, the conceptions of modern philosophy? Nobody, as far as I can see. But yes, vitalism was this impulse in biology that persisted clear up until the 1920s with embryologists like Driesch and, and uh, his school. And it, 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 mechanical biology has been at great pains to suppress that. That's why Rupert Sheldrake is such a breath of fresh air, because he can be seen as uh, a, a person carrying the vitalist message back into science. I mean, his new book on the greening of science and nature is nothing more than a manifestation, I'm, I'm sorry, a manifesto for the re-recognition of the presence of, uh, of the world soul. <laughs> what about the Native Americans that were living that philosophy until we wiped them out? Yes, well, Aboriginal people, not only the Native Americans, but the tribes of the Amazon, if you live next to nature, this is such an overwhelming perception that it's never called into question. But you see, we trace, we, most of us, trace our civilization to desert dwellers who invented agriculture, which gave us surpluses. So then we had to build walled enclosures to defend our surpluses from starving neighbors and we're talking 6,000 B.C. at Jericho for this kind of stuff. And so we have been cut off from the natural mind longer than any other group of people on earth. This is how we are able to carry out the demonic, in the negative sense, the demonic uh, 
uh, reconstruction of the world that we have. I mean, uh, what we have done is, you know, if there is a sin, then we have sinned, you know. Robert Oppenheimer said, beyond all rational argument, the physicists have known sin. And it's because they reached into the heart of matter without reverence. And their best trick was to call down the light that burns at the center of stars. And they call it down to the test centers of our deserts and on to the heads of our enemies, if necessary. But this is a cosmic sin. It's an abomination. Um, It's the story of Western civilization. The first great error was the the urbanization, well, I don't know, first grade error, the invention of agriculture was a pretty staggering bad turn, then urbanization, and then a piece of bad luck that really we didn't need to have befall us, which was the invention of the phonetic alphabet. And with the invention of the phonetic alphabet, we moved away from symbolism and lost even the symbolic connection to the world. And that happened with the evolution of, uh, of Demotic Greek and, uh, and even earlier languages, linear A and B and that kind of stuff. McLuhan talks a lot about this. I mean, we live in a universe so alienated that we can barely conceive uh, of the way back. But hopefully, uh, you know, Archaeology is a wonderful thing. I mean, we are actually, as I said to you last night, digging into the stratigraphic layers of our past and reconstructing these ancient intellectual machines and setting their gears turning and and seeing how it works. And hopefully, when we recover, we're like amnesiacs. We're like people who don't remember who we are or where we came from, and we just wander mumbling through the streets of our cities, foraging in garbage cans and and, uh, frightening uh, other people. And yet, if we could wake up, and archaeology and and uh, and the uh, you know the rebirth of an awareness of the goddess and uh, the pushing of science to the point where its irrational foundations become more clear this is all part of a program of awakening of an archaic revival that will then make us part of the living world rather than a disease a parasitic force upon it This refers to the theme I touched on a little bit last night of the importance of the imagination and how I think that our destiny lies in the imagination. God is ever existent and makes manifest all else, but he himself is hidden because he is ever existent. He manifests all things but is not manifested. He is not himself brought into being in images presented through our senses, but he presents all things to us in such images. It is only things which are brought into being that are presented through sense. Coming into being is nothing else than presentation through sense. This is so thoroughly modern. It's just staggering. I mean, it's, for a thousand or 1,500 years, people couldn't say anything that clearly. It is evident then that he who alone has not come into being cannot be presented through sense, and that being so, he is hidden from our sight. But he presents all things to us through our senses and thereby manifests himself through all things and in all things, and especially to those whom he wills to manifest himself. For though thought alone can see that which is hidden, inasmuch as thought itself is hidden from sight, and if even the thought which is within you is hidden from your sight, how can he, being in himself, be manifested to you through your bodily eyes? But if you have power to see with the eyes of the mind, then, my son, he will manifest himself to you. For the Lord manifests himself ungrudgingly through all the universe, and you can behold God's image with your eyes and lay hold on it with your hands. 
to my mind, this is the permission for the psychedelic experience, that we lay hold of the image of the ineffable through the eyes. If you wish to see him, think on the sun, think on the course of the moon, think on the order of the stars. The sun is the greatest of the gods in heaven. To him, as to their king and overlord, all the gods of heaven yield place. And yet this mighty God, greater than earth and sea, submits to have smaller stars circling above him. Who is it then, my son, that he obeys with reverence and awe? Each of these stars, too, is confined by measured limits and has an appointed space to range in. Why do not all the stars in heaven run like and equal courses? Who is it that has assigned to each its place and marked out each for the extent of its course? And then it goes on and on. And then here is an amazing modern anticipation of modernity. Would that it were not possible for you to grow wings and soar into the air. Poised between earth and heaven, you might see the solid earth, the fluid sea, and the streaming rivers, the wandering air, the penetrating fire, the courses of the stars, and the swiftness of the movement with which heaven encompasses all. What happiness were that, my son, to see all these borne along with one impulse and to behold him who is unmoved moving in all that moves and him who is hidden made manifest through his works. This is an image of the planet seen from space. I mean, it's uh, absolutely the unified image of our planet. And it is, I think, the, the central image in this early hermetic thing. This is the unifying, this is as close to an image of what Godhead is that they were able to reach. I mean, this is a shamanic flight that delivers uh, a scientific description of the earth moving in space. This was written A.D. 150. Uh, this is book five. Uh, nobody had that insight until we reached Giordano Bruno. And if you read Giordano Bruno in the Hermetic tradition, you know that Bruno was burned at the stake. And the reason he was burned at the stake was because he looked up into the sky and did not see the stellar shells and the angelic hierarchies. Bruno had a mystical experience and when it was over, he said, the universe is infinite. The stars go on forever. And that single statement was just the intellectual dynamite that destroyed the whole medieval, Hellenistic, the entire previous cosmological vision was left behind with that single statement. It was such a powerful statement that he had to go to the stake for that. And uh, we have never recovered from, from that perception. It, it was a fundamental perception and it occurred because he looked without precondition into the night sky and did not see, you know, wheels and demons and angels and shells of cosmic fate and necessity. And he just said, you know, that's bullshit. <laughs> what is there is infinite space, infinite time. The stars are hung like lamps unto the utmost regions of infinity. And this then inaugurates the beginning of modernity. And, uh, and it's uh, a perception that arose on the foundation of all of this uh, earlier thinking. Here's another passage uh, on the imagination. Yes? This somehow is the way of reaching the vision. Well, the practice, it, we know a lot less about that because there was much secrecy around this. What we have are the philosophical discourses and then when we talk about alchemy this afternoon, we'll see that there the technique 
becomes projection onto matter, that you enter into a kind of self-hypnosis where by having these what we call naive ontological categories, in other words, not being sure exactly how much of mind is in matter or how much matter is in mind, you can erase the boundary between self and world and project the contents of the unconscious onto uh, chemical processes. Now, what went on in the early phase here, we don't know. The hermetic, the trismegistic hymns are largely, as you see them here, philosophical discourses. There was stress on diet and purity. Asceticism was typical of the hermetic approach. In Gnosticism, it went one of several ways. There were schools of Gnosticism which were uh, vegetarian and uh, puristic. And then, because they felt that man was no part of the universe, that man was somehow hermetically sealed, if you will, hermetically sealed against contamination from the universe, uh, some Gnostic schools said, you can do anything you want. You can have any kind of sexual arrangement you want. You can do anything you want because you are not, do not think that you are part of the universe. And so you, you had Gnostic schools side by side, some orgiastic and quasi-tantric and some ascetic. There were Gnostic sects that, you see, because the idea was that light was trapped in matter by the act of procreation, there were Gnostic sects that only practiced forms of sexual union that couldn't lead to conception. So there were presumably exclusively uh, homosexual sects. There were sects which only practiced uh, anal intercourse. And for them, that was the same as celibacy because the real concern was not to trap any more of the light. And, you know, I don't seriously advocate this, but I think in our current situation of overpopulation, a little dose of this kind of thinking wouldn't be a bad thing. I mean, too much light is trapped in the organic matrix. And, and so they, they, and these Gnostic sects that, for instance, were uh, exclusively homosexual or exclusively uh, practiced anal intercourse, of course, they were suicide sects. Uh, they disappeared very quickly because they could only make converts by uh, uh, con in, in missionary conversion. You couldn't, you didn't have children, you couldn't hand it on. But it shows, you know, how thoroughgoing their rejection of, uh, of the world was, how contaminated they felt themselves to be uh, by the material world. And, but then you also had, as I mentioned, these optimistic schools that saw nature as something to be perfected and, uh, and said man has been set onto the earth not to reject it, but to perfect it. And um, utopianism, the belief that one can create a perfect society, it goes back into these hermetic uh, ideals because the idea was that a perfect society could be the goal of the alchemical work. Let me read you a passage from uh, Giordano Bruno. This is a wonderful passage from the Picatrix. Remember Picatrix? This was the book of magical, 12th century magical texts that began to introduce these hermetic ideas. And this passage is the core passage that inspired the Rosicrucians and numerous other uh, utopian movements. Um, this is a, a, here is Francis Yates. Hermes Trismegistus is often mentioned as the source for some talismanic images and in other connections, but there is in particular one very striking passage in the fourth book of Picatrix in which Hermes is stated to have been the first to use magical images and is credited with having founded a marvelous city in Egypt. 
And here is the passage from the Picatrix. There are among the Chaldeans very perfect masters in this art, and they affirm that Hermes was the first who constructed images by means of which he knew how to regulate the Nile against the motion of the moon. This man also built a temple to the sun, and he knew how to hide himself from all so that no one could see him, although he was within it. Now, those of you who are scholars of Rosicrucianism know that one of the things that was always said about Rosicrucians was that they were invisible. This this was how Robert Flood proved to people that he wasn't a Rosicrucian. He'd say, you're looking at me, so how can I be one? And so he's in the temple, but he could not be seen within it. It was he, Hermes Trismegistus, too, who in the east of Egypt constructed a city 12 miles long within which he constructed a castle which had four gates in each of its four parts. On the eastern gate, he placed the form of an eagle. On the western gate, the form of a bull. On the southern gate, the form of a lion. And on the northern gate, he constructed the form of a dog. Into these images, he introduced spirits which spoke with voices. Nor could anyone enter the gates of the city except by their permission. There he planted trees, in the midst of which was a great tree which bore the fruit of all generation. On the summit of the castle, he caused to be raised a tower 30 cubits high, on the top of which he ordered to be placed a lighthouse, the color of which changed every day until the seventh day, after which it returned to the first color. And so the city was illuminated with these colors. Near the city, there was abundance of waters in which dwelt many kinds of fish. Around the circumference of the city, He placed engraved images and ordered them in such a manner that by their virtue the inhabitants were made virtuous and withdrawn from all wickedness and harm. The name of the city was Adocentine. Now, what we're familiar with from the Platonic literature is a quasi-rational, largely rational approach to utopian thinking that you get in the Republic. However, students of the Republic will recall that the the fifth, is it the fifth or tenth book of the Republic contains the myth of Ur, which we went over in detail in the section I did on Neoplatonism. And the myth of Ur is one of the most bizarre and puzzling passages in the entire in the entire ancient literature. You recall Ur, E R, was a soldier who died. He was killed in battle. But after eight days, he returned to life. And then he told a story that is the absolute puzzlement of ancient scholars. It's highly mathematical. It has to do with the spindle of necessity and the description of some kind of cosmic machine and all the ratios of the gears of this machine are given. And nobody knows what is being talked about. But here we have a different thrust, a magical utopianism and the idea of a perfected human society using magic because uh, uh, these engraved images that he ordered in such a manner that by their virtue the inhabitants were made virtuous, that means he was able to deflect the energies of cosmic fate. The city was immune to astrological Uh, malefic influence. It was protected. Uh, And when we talk later about the alchemical aspirations of the Rosicrucians and John Dee and Frederick the Elector Palatine of Bohemia, we'll see that this impulse toward an alchemical kingdom returns again and again. In a way, utopianism is... The, the, the foregated city of utopian magical dreaming is one version of the philosopher's stone. It's a, a kind of diffuse notion of the philosopher's stone, but it's a society in perfect harmony with fully realized beings uh, living within it, practicing a cosmic religion that frees them uh, from the exige- the, the um the impulses of cosmic fate. 
the other thing that is going on in some of this alchemical imagery is uh, a kind of subtext of late alchemy is what's called the ars memoria, the art of memory. And um, in fact, Francis Yates has a book called The Art of Memory. And uh, this is a, a lost art, literally. It begins with the Roman orator Cicero and was practiced up until the early 17th century. And what it consisted of was uh, people, uh, orators, it was considered very bad form to read your speech if you were an orator. And so you had to memorize your speech, and there were tricks of memory. And uh, the commonest mnemonic trick was to think of um, a building. It was called the memory palace, a building that is familiar to you. I've done this myself with the University of California because it's an area that I'm very familiar with because I was a student there and there are many buildings and many hallways and many floors. And what you do is when you make your speech, in your mind, you are moving through the memory palace. And at various points, you construct what are called emblemata. And the idea of these emblemata is that they be as... Um, unusual, shocking, and unexpected as possible in order to be memorable to you. So say you're giving a, a, a speech about the seven deadly sins. Well, so then uh, uh, luxuria might be for you a nun copulating with a dog, and, and, and you'll set the nun and the dog in a little niche in the hallway of the memory palace. Well, then when you reach that place in your imaginary journey, all these associations will spring to mind, and you will be able to give your speech um, flawlessly. And to us, this sounds tortured and peculiar, but it works quite well. One of the great practitioners of the Ars Memoria was Giordano Bruno, and he wrote a book called uh, Lo Specchio delle Bestia Triunfante, The Expulsion of the Triumphant Beast. And my God, Max Ernst, eat your heart out. I mean, this is a surreal epic read as straight plain text because that's not how it's supposed to be read. It's an agglomeration of these mnemonic emblemata that led him on then to probably give a fairly conventional disputation on one subject or another. But there are even uh, old books of these emblemata that are, uh, before surrealism, these were some of the wildest images that the Western mind uh, would tolerate. The one thing that we didn't get into this morning was talking about uh, the astrological side of it and the role of the decans. The decans are these demons, three to a sign, so there are 36 of them. And this was thought to be an, an astrological conceit that goes back to Egypt as opposed to the ordinary zodiacal um, significators which go back to Haran in, uh, in what is now modern Iraq and these, um, these decans were the demons that were summoned by these renaissance uh, magi in an effort to control and manipulate fate you may, if you were paying attention this morning, noticed that in all the reading I did from the Corpus Hermeticum, there was really nothing explicitly magical uh, about it. It was philosophical. There was one mention, I think, of animating statues in the description of the four-gated city. But it was those magical uh, animation passages that really captured the imagination of the Renaissance, and uh, they built on that. And the idea, simply put, is that these decans and zodiacal signs are um, 
at the center of associative schemata which include plants, minerals, odors, certain flowers, certain animals. Everything had its deconic assignation. And so if you were involved in uh, uh, promoting an affair with a woman or something like that, then you would do an invocation to Venus and you would gather the associated minerals, stones, animals, and you would put them in a room and then certain musical, certain tonal modes were also associated with these things. And so you would play the music, you would have the flowers present, the minerals present, the invocations, and what you were trying to do is create a microcosm of the macrocosm to draw down this stellar energy. It wasn't about the classical Hollywood appearance of demons in a circle. That's the stuff of Picatrix, the earlier, somewhat less refined uh, style of magic. Um, Let's see. Yes. Oh, here it is. I did bring it. I wanted to read you one passage here. From uh, This is Francis Yates again in Giordano and the Hermetic Tradition because this describes this change of status of the magician that we're interested in. Um, And also what we didn't talk about this morning was the importance of Kabbalah, which came in uh, quite late but was then worked out in great detail. This was originally the idea, it it was the Jewish contribution to this kind of magic. It was the idea that since the world had been made by Jehovah, by the speaking of words, in principio et verbum et verbo caro factum est, in other words, the speaking of Hebrew was thought to be the uh, use of a primary linguistic tool for the purposes of creation. The problem for these Italians was very few of them spoke Hebrew. And so uh, it was uh, sometimes practiced silently, the mere constructing of these Hebrew letters and the setting out of messages in Hebrew was deemed efficacious as well. And then a further declension for people who were even frustrated was with that was to um, channel magical languages which were pseudo-Hebraic in structure and appearance. And uh, this is a whole branch of research, much too arcane for us to go into here. The only non-Hebraic magical language that I may mention will be Enochian. And Enochian was an angelic Language channeled to John D and used by him uh, in his magical evocations, and then later it was taken up by Aleister Crowley and uh, Crowley and the and the folks of the Golden Dawn. But there were many, many of these magical uh, languages. The Vonich manuscript is is written in one of them. But I want to read you this passage about how the Renaissance changed the status of the magician. We begin to perceive here an extraordinary change in the status of the magician. The necromancer concocting his filthy mixtures, the conjurer making his frightening invocations, were both outcasts from society, regarded as dangers to religion, and forced into plying their trades in secrecy. These old-fashioned characters are hardly recognizable in the philosophical and pious magi of the Renaissance. There is a change in status almost comparable to the change in status of the artist from the mere mechanic of the Middle Ages to the learned and refined companion of princes of the Renaissance, and the magics themselves are changed almost out of recognition. 
Who could recognize the necromancer studying his picatrix in secret in the elegant facino with his infinitely refined use of sympathies, his classical incantations, his elaborately neoplatonized talismans? Who could recognize the conjurer using the barbarous techniques of some clavus salamanus in the mystical pico, lost in the religious ecstasies of Kabbalah, drawing archangels? to his side and yet there is a kind of continuity because the techniques are at bottom based on the same principles Ficino's magic is an infinitely refined and reformed version of pneumatic necromancy Pico's practical Kabbalah is an intensely religious and mystical version of conjuring so now we move in this realm I mean these were the companions of princes and there was, uh, in that 120 years, from let's say 1500 to the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, a constant effort in various parts of Europe to try and turn European society toward a kind of magical revolution. I mean, the Europe of the 11th and 12th century was entirely ruled by scholastic rationalism. Witchcraft was virtually unknown and very curious. It's the 15th and 16th century where you get this tremendous proliferation of magical systems, magical ideas, and social hysterias related to witchcraft, alchemy, conjuring, uh, and magic. I mean, th those are the centuries when these things really broke out into the open. And alchemy in, th in that period is basically a story of personalities, wonderful personalities, too many for us to really talk about in detail. I mean, we have Nicholas and, and Pertinel Flamel, who sought and found the Philosopher's Stone, according to legend, and according to legend are living to this day somewhere in Central Asia in perfect happiness, uh, having achieved not only the chemical wedding, but the water stone of the wise. And then we have uh, Basil Valentine, who uh, uh, refined red wine and distilled it in distillation apparatus until he got uh, essentially pure alcohol. And upon drinking this, he was so convinced that he had found the Philosopher's Stone mm -hmm. that he announced the imminent approach of the end of the world based on his discovery. Mm -hmm. And he was not secretive at all. He, he propagated his recipes and, uh, and in fact, sampled the uh, distillates of some of his brother alchemists and popularized this very widely. To this day, the reason uh, certain cognacs are in the hands of monastic orders and no one else can make these things is because they were originally alchemical secrets. And many of these early alchemists were men of the cloth, uh, uh, quite a, a number of them.